with two parts. One will be the electron transport chain, and the second will be ATP synthase. So the first part is picking up where we left off. We have all these electrons that we got from doing the citric acid cycle. We got some from doing glycolysis in the form of NADH as well. Those are going to transfer those carried electrons to other complexes, other proteins found in the membrane, and ultimately send those electrons all the way down from one complex to the next to the next until we give it to an electron sink. So just a place to throw electrons when we're done with them. So it must really want electrons. And our sink is going to be molecular oxygen, and that's why you need to breathe oxygen. So the electrons are being given to oxygen along with some protons. They're effectively along for the ride here. And that will turn an oxygen molecule into a pair of water molecules. Okay. The whole point of doing all that was not to make water and not to consume oxygen. The point of doing all that was to pump some protons across the membrane. So we'll take some protons and send them across the membrane. And then that gives us a gradient of protons. There'll be more on one side than the other. They clearly have an impetus to come back across the membrane. There's an imbalance. So we let them come back across, but as they do so, they must come across and make ATP for me. It's a turnstile they must go through. Well, I've got a little analogy to show you for that. So they'll turn this machine that turns ATP and phosphate into ATP. And then we'll talk about how we get that ATP into the cytoplasm and restore all the phosphates we need and ADPs and so forth. But to remember where we left off, look at the figure on the top right. We've already talked about the part in the middle, that TCA in the circle. That's our tricarboxylic acid cycle, or citric acid cycle, or Krebs cycle. Right? So in that cycle, we generated some CO2, which has no bearing on this whatsoever. But we did make some NADH3, in fact, and one FADH2. And those things are carrying electrons for me. Okay, so in one round, I got eight electrons out of those oxidation events. We did Four of the eight reactions were redox reactions. So I get four pairs of electrons. I have eight electrons that have pulled out of the system. And the cartoonish diagram in, in yellow is represented the electron transport chain. It's not one complex. It's not one pump like you see. It's a series of these. It's just drawn as one figure here. And those things are going to transport electrons from the NADHs and FADH2s through many hands and ultimately give them to O2. Right, which will reduce the O2 to water. Remember, giving someone electrons is reduction. Taking electrons from something is oxidation. The protons are along for the ride here. Okay? And the, the goal of doing all the electron transport, as we said, was to have this series of complexes pump protons out of the mitochondria. So this is happening in our matrix, the very center of our mitochondria. We're going to pump some protons across that inner membrane. So if you remember from last time, we looked at the anatomy as well. It's got two barriers, an inner and an outer membrane, which separates the area into three compartments. We have the very outside, that's the cytoplasm. We have the space between the membranes called the intermembrane space. And we have the space enclosed in the very center called the matrix. The outer mitochondrial membrane, shown in yellow here in the, in the anatomy diagram, has, I said, holes in it. Right? It's got pores in it. It's got places where small molecules can get across, right? So it's not watertight like the inner membrane is. There, you can't really go across unless you have a specific carrier for you. And we'll talk about some of those. So to get things across the inner membrane, we're going to need some kind of gated channel or gated pore, right? So here, we're going to use our complexes in this electron transport chain to pump protons out, right, from the matrix into that intermembrane space, which of course is continuous with the cytoplasm. So we're going to let, let them come back in, and that comes across the ATP synthase, shown up there in the cartoon in that pinkish purple color. Right? We let the protons come back across, this thing actually turns, and it makes an ATP on the inside. Our last thing we need to discuss today is how do you get that ATP out of the mitochondria, because I need it in the matrix, or I need it in the cytoplasm. So let's, let's start from the beginning. We have NADHs and FADH2s generated in glycolysis and in the citric acid cycle. We even got one from the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. So what do we do with all those NADHs and the one FADH2 we made? Okay, so they start out at the beginning. 
right, in the cytoplasm or in the inner membrane space, and they come to the inner membrane, right, at the surface of the inner membrane. They're going to give their electrons to a bunch of transport molecules, which we'll talk about all four of those in detail in a minute. And those electrons pass down the chain. And as they do, we use the transfer of electrons from one to the next. It's downhill in energy. And we'll use that reservoir of, of energy gradient to pump some protons. So if you think about it from a broad sense, we're taking electrons bound to NAD and FAD, right? That's an electron energy potential and giving it to a molecule who would love the electrons a little more, so that's a favorable transfer, use that energy to pump some protons across the membrane. I've now converted that electrical energy into a gradient of potential, right? Then I'm going to let the protons come right back across the membrane, use it to turn it in that difference into a mechanical energy. We're going to turn a, a machine, so it's a mechanical energy at this point. And then that mechanical energy is transferred back to chemical energy in the form of putting another phosphate on an ADP to make the high energy ATP, right? That last phosphate doesn't want to go on easily. So we've got, done a lot of transfers. Generally, when you transfer from one type to another, you lose some energy in the process. That's entropy. You're going to always lose some energy, go downhill, but it's fairly efficient, right? It's not 100%, but it's very efficient compared to, say, your uh, internal combustion engine in your car right, which is only, you know, 20 to 25, maybe 30% efficient. Or your refrigerator in your, your kitchen, right, which may be up to 100% efficient, but it totally depends on the temperature difference between the inside of the fridge and the room it's in. But it's not nearly as good as this. This is nearly 100% efficient transfer because it's on a much smaller scale. Okay. So here's our series of molecules or complexes found in that inner mitochondrial membrane. Everything here is located in that membrane or near it. And we're going to see where the electrons flow. So at the top of the figure, on the y-axis, you notice we have a relative energy or a relative amount of energy compared to O2. You could make these numbers anything you want, right? The scale is irrelevant, but it's a matter of if you go down the y-axis from say zero here to minus 200 or whatever the numbers might be, it's a relative scale. As you go down, it's more favorable. This looks a lot like our diagrams from earlier when we were doing the, the enzyme kinetics or enzyme progress. And we showed uh, the before and after pictures and lines with and without an enzyme it had to flow across the diagram. Same thing's happening here. This is free energy, a relative, and the lower you go on this y-axis, the more stable it is. So things tend to want to go downhill, just like in our enzyme diagram. So at the top, we have NADH, which has a lot of potential energy there. FADH2, slightly less. You see it's a little lower on the scale. NADH gives its electrons to complex 1, shown in purple there. Um, you don't have to worry about all the ions listed. We'll talk about what the components they contain later. But, but no, it gives its electrons to complex 1. So let's talk about the pathways first. NADH always donates its electrons to complex 1. FADH2 is found in complex two. That is succinate dehydrogenase. It is the enzyme from the citric acid cycle, right? It's moonlighting as one of these carriers, right? So it's not a separate thing. It is the same thing. Complex two is succinate dehydrogenase. Remember that was the only one of the eight that was not floating around in the matrix. It's the only membrane bound one. This is why. Both of those complexes, one and two, never interact with each other but they both give their electrons to ubiquinone, also known as Q. Right, so we'll call it Q for short. Right, so complex one got its electrons from NADH and gives them the Q. Complex two generated the electrons and its reaction from succinate to fumarate, gives them temporarily to FADH2, and then gives those to Q as well. So they have a common pathway at this point from Q onward, whether you entered as NADH or as FADH2 slash succinate, you both end up at Q, but you don't go from one to two or two to one. That never happens. Okay. So we're at complex, or sorry, we're at Q, and we're gonna give those electrons from Q, ubiquinone, to complex three. Right. Complex three then gives the electrons to cytochrome C, and then cytochrome C gives those electrons to complex four. You notice every step here is a little farther down the y-axis. It's a scale. 
every step that we transfer these electrons is a favorable transfer, right? In other words, it has a negative delta G. So it's a favorable thing. They tend to not go backwards. Finally, when we have it at complex four, you see there's a huge drop when it gives it to oxygen to form water. Right? It's like falling off a cliff here, right? And you can't go backwards. So it's exceedingly favorable to give those electrons to oxygen to make water, which drives the whole thing forward. If you stop supplying oxygen, this whole chain backs up and you can't make a lot of ATP and you won't be able to survive. Those mitochondria will die, the cells that host them will die, and ultimately the organism will die. So we need to talk about how all these transfers happen. What are they transferring? Electrons. How many? It's going to be one or two. We'll talk about which ones. And along the way, this, this diagram doesn't show it, but complexes one, three, and four, not two, but one, three, and four do the pumping of the protons across the membrane. So I don't want you to get confused about electron movement and proton movement. Electrons are the things being handed off in a baton here from one complex to one carrier to one complex to one carrier, eventually to O2. Protons are the things being pumped across the membrane. They're not being carried by these complexes. They're just pumps for protons, not complex two. Okay, so that's shown on the next figure. The same one on the right up there. I, I shrunk down for you so we can keep it in mind as we talk about these. I, so, I told you there was some iron. You see those FEs in all these structures. Well, iron's really good at carrying electrons, like most metals are, especially transition metals, because they can change oxidation state. Right? So iron goes from being plus two to plus three, right? When it gains that, or when it loses that electron, and when it gains the electron, which is a negative charge, it goes from plus three back to plus two. And so iron and lots of other metals are good for doing this, and we see there's iron in all these complexes. They generally get from complex one and two onto three onto four the iron clusters tend to get larger right which puts them farther down this scale so if you look at the figure at the bottom where it says iron sulfur clusters in panel a it shows an iron atom being held by four cysteine amino acids now you remember your amino acids at the end of a cysteine is that sh or sulfhydryl group if we were to lose the h it would just be s minus and that s can make a bond to iron in fact it can make four bonds to cysteine. Iron can make four bonds here easily. So when iron is being held very tightly by these four cysteines, that's generally the arrangement we'll see in complexes one and two, for instance. If we move to panel B, you notice we now have two irons and two sulfurs still held by four cysteines. Now I'm not calling those sulfurs on cysteine because it's part of the cysteine amino acid, but the other two sulfurs in yellow there are not part of an amino acid. They're just regular old sulfur sitting there, just like iron. So panel A is just called an iron, right? And panel B, we call it a two iron, two sulfur cluster. So it makes a little square there in the center. Again, still held by four cysteines. And we find those in complex three, the two iron, two sulfur clusters. In complex four, we tend to find the one in panel C, which is a four iron, four sulfur cluster. So if you look at the center of it, you see there's eight atoms there, four sulfurs and four irons, and it looks like a little cube. It's called a cubane structure, right? So it's a little cube of four irons and four sulfurs, again, still held by four cysteines, right? So it's much more complex to build, but it also has a, a higher potential to, or a lower potential, but a, a higher tendency to hold on to electrons than the other ones before it. So it's farther down the list. And we tend to find those in complex four. So as we go across from complex one or two to three to four, the iron sulfur clusters tend to get larger. But the ratio of iron to sulfur really doesn't change, right? It's either two and two or four and four, right? So the, the ratio doesn't change much, but they do become a more complex, larger structure. Right? In addition to these iron sulfur clusters, we have heme groups, much like the heme in hemoglobin. Right? And a picture of that is shown at the top of the figure here. So in the top right, we have a, what's called a polyporphyrin ring, much like the ones in hemoglobin, but this one is a little different. Right? And the differences are what's attached on the outside, all those things in blue and pink up there. But in the center, we still hold an iron atom. Right? We could replace the iron with something else and make other things. Like if we put cobalt there, that would be cobalamin. That's your vitamin B12. If we did put uh, a magnesium there, it would be a, 
a different color. It would look more greenish because that was the, the component found in chlorophyll. And if we put other metals there, you get other colors and some have no color at all. Right? But here we're going to put an iron so this thing will look a brownish color. And that's why your mitochondria tend to look brown. Right? Our muscle, when it's not loaded in oxygen or after you cook it, tends to look brown because, well, one of the reasons, but you have all this iron in there which gives it a dark color. Okay, so that's our other carrier of electrons. The final carriers of electrons, we'll go back to this figure for a second. If you look at what's carrying electrons between, or what's a shuttle carrying electrons between complex one to three or two to three, we have this molecule called ubiquinone or Q, right? It's a very small thing. It's not a big complex like one, two, or three, and four. It's a very small molecule and it carries the electrons or shuttles them from one to three or two to three. And that's a picture of that molecule here at the bottom. Right? It's a very small thing compared to those big complexes. And looking at the structure, do you think it's water soluble? So the best place to look at it is on the one on the bottom left. It shows all the atoms. Do you think this thing's water soluble? So I'll give you a hint. Look at the part in blue. No. Why not? It's a really long chain, an alkane chain, alkene chain. Right, so it's a really long chain, and long chains can be soluble, but this one's severely lacking anything but carbon and hydrogen. So it's a long hydrocarbon chain. It's really fatty, much like our fatty acids were, right? So yes, you're right, and that thing is how long? There's 10 copies of that thing. Each thing in parentheses there has five carbons in it. It's four in a row and a methyl group branched off. Those are isoprene units. And we put 10 of those in a row. So that's a 40 carbon chain with 10 methyl groups or 50 carbons total. That thing is in no way soluble, which is the idea. This is gonna stay in the membrane. So it's gonna transfer electrons for me from complexes one to three or from two to three, but it never leaves the membrane. Okay, so it occurs in three forms. We have the Q form, we're going to call ubiquinone, on the left there. And if you look at the ring structure for a second, you see there's some methoxy groups on the left, there's a methyl on the right, there's that really long blue tail, and then it's got two carbonyls on it, right? Two ketone groups. In the next step, if I give it one electron, and of course the proton's along for the ride, it becomes the semiquinone in the middle. We're going to write it as QH dot. Okay, so I gained one electron and one proton. If Q did not have a charge before, it will not have a charge now because I gave it one positively charged thing and one negatively charged thing. So overall, it doesn't have a charge. However, it does have one unpaired electron. Right? So that electron down there is unpaired. So this is a radical. So if I give it an electron and give it a proton, you notice some of the double bonds rearrange and we get the aromatic ring in the center. And then I have a hydroxy group on top, which you're probably yelling at the figure like I am when they drew the bond to the H instead of the O. So you know better than that. The one on the right, they fixed it. And then at the bottom, you have what's called O dot, which means that oxygen has its normal bond, you see. It's got its normal two lone pairs, and then it's got one extra unpaired electron. That's a radical. Now that's a dangerous thing because what could happen is that molecule in the middle could just lose a proton, Right, and becomes a semiquinone radical ion. And now we have a negative charge on top and the O dot on the bottom, and that can cause some damage if it interferes with other proteins or RNA or DNA or other molecules. Right, so we don't want that to happen. We'd rather keep it as the semiquinone and give it a second electron. So we're gonna give it another electron and give it another proton. Here, another mistake in the figure. They say two protons there, should say one, because we already gave it one. And again, it would have no net charge. So we have a molecule on the right that's now a benzene ring with two OHs on it. And what would you call that? It, they're opposite of each other, so they're across the ring on one and four. So what would you call that thing? A benzene ring with two OHs opposite each other. You learned this name before. Hydroquinone? 
hydroquinone, exactly. And you were wondering, why does it have such an odd name at the time? Because it's a quinone, which is the structure on the left here, that now has some extra hydrogens on it, right? And the electrons, of course. So it's hydroquinone, also known as ubiquinol, because it is an alcohol, right? So that's where that name came from. It's a hydroquinone. It's not just a quinone anymore. It's got some hydrogens. And so this form, also not water-soluble, but it's carrying something for me. And other than the H's, which is what we use to indicate it as QH2, but it's carrying that pair of electrons for me. That's the important thing. So this thing will carry two electrons for me. I give it one and a proton, and then I give it the second one and another proton, and I'm at this QH2 form. Okay? I don't want the middle reaction to happen where it becomes the radical ion. So I I'd rather limit that occurrence. Okay, so I'd like to give it two electrons and get to this QH2. Of course, the QH2 will then show up at complex 3, which we'll, we'll see again in a second. Dump those electrons and protons off, become the Q on the far left again, and then go back and get some more. Right, so it's a ferry between the two. I'm going to keep referring to this Q as a truck later. You'll understand why. Okay, so here's our pathway one more time. Starting at the top, you don't have to memorize the, uh, the voltage differences there, so I'm not interested in you learning those, but I want you to know the general pathway. So if we start at the top, we have NADH, and we give it to the first yellow box there. It's called the NADHQ oxidoreductase. That's a really long name, but it's just complex one. That's another name for it. An easy way to remember these other names is if you remember complex one gets its electrons from NADH and gives them to Q, you can name it. The names are simply from whom do I get the electrons and to whom do I get them, followed by the word oxidoreductase. So complex one gets it from NADH, gives them the Q, therefore its name is just the NADHQ oxidoreductase because I'm oxidizing the NADH and I'm reducing the Q. Right, so the names are easy to remember. It's, we just call it complex one. But if you know where it gets its electrons and to whom it's giving them, the name just pops out. Okay? Complex two doesn't get one of these names because it already has a name. Right? We call it the succinate Q reductase here, but it was succinate dehydrogenase complex. It was the very enzyme from citric acid cycle. It's the same enzyme. It's just doing this part of the pathway here. Okay? That one, mysteriously, does not pump protons. It already had a day job. It doesn't need to do something else. It was part of the citric acid cycle. Complex 1 in the yellow box here does pump protons. Complex 2 does not. Okay, so ultimately we end up at Q. Q then transfers its electrons to complex 3. That's the next yellow box. And gives complex 3 gives its electron to cytochrome C. So if you had to name it, you would name the thing it's oxidizing, which is technically QH2 at that point. They just call it quinone. And then you give it the electron to cytochrome C, and then you say oxidoreductase. So also known as complex three. Right, and then the last complex at the bottom is called cytochrome C oxidase, that's complex four. It gets its electrons from cytochrome C, and it gives them to O2. Now, if we follow our scheme, we should name this thing the cytochrome C O2 oxidoreductase. But since it's the end of the line, they kind of got lazy and just named it cytochrome C oxidase. And you assume it's going to reduce the O2 to water. If you want to call it the cytochrome C O2 oxidoreductase, I'm happy with that. Just know it's complex four, and it also pumps protons. Okay, you know from where it gets the electrons, cytochrome C, and to whom it gives them, O2. Okay. The other thing I want you to know from here is if you look back at Q up there, Remember Q you told me was not water soluble. It's lipid soluble. So when transferring the electrons from either complex one to three or two to three, it doesn't leave the membrane. Okay, so it never gives them from one to two or two to one. It's from one to three or two to three. And it stays in the membrane, it's lipid soluble. The other carrier, cytochrome C, is very water soluble. It's not in the membrane at all. It's a water soluble thing. So it leaves the membrane. It's actually on the outside of the membrane. It picks up the electrons from complex three and gives them to complex four, again, on the outside of the membrane. And so I have a little figure here. 
on the right, top right again, showing all those things at a smaller scale there. You don't have to know the, the electron volts or anything. Just know that as we go down from complex, or from NADH to complex one, to Q, to three, to cytochrome C, to four, to O2, just reading down the scale there, you notice the voltage gets more positive. Voltage is just a measure of difference in potential. That's all it is. If two things are a thousand volts apart, that means that the electrical potential between the two is 1,000 volts. It's this, no matter what their charge is, right? It's the difference is what matters, right? So I'll give you an example of that is how fast you're driving. If you're driving at 10 miles an hour and someone is not moving at all and you run into them, you're gonna hit them at 10 miles an hour. That's the difference in the speed. However, if you're driving at 70 miles an hour and you run into another car doing 60 miles an hour, the collision is still only a 10 mile an hour difference. Now, you're gonna probably run into other things at that point, but that's not what I'm talking about. The energy of the initial impact is the same. It's a 10 mile an hour difference. So same thing here. It doesn't matter what the charge is, it just measures what the voltage is, the difference. And as long as that voltage gets more positive as I go down, electrons being negative, wanna go in that direction. That's all we're saying. Hey, but what, what I want you to get out of the, the bottom part of this slide is the table. And let's, let's not pay attention so much to their masses and subunits and prosthetic groups and things, but look on the right and asking you where it gets things, what it gets them from, by things, I mean electrons, and then to whom does it give the electrons and where are they located. So complex one, Roman numeral one there, gets its electrons from NADH on the matrix side, right, because NADH is in the matrix. That's where we generated most of it from the citric acid cycle. And then it gives those electrons to Q, which is neither on the matrix nor the cytoplasmic side. It's in the membrane. So it's in the membrane core, we said. So complex one, Roman numeral one there, gets its electrons from NADH from inside, gives them to Q in the membrane. Complex two gets its electrons from succinate, right? Temporarily gives them to FAD to make FADH2. And then those are transferred to Q to make QH2. So same scenario. It picked it up from the inside and gave it to Q in the membrane. Complex three gives its electrons from Q in the membrane and gives them to cytochrome C. But cytochrome C, we said, was water soluble. It's located in that inner membrane space or outside. Right? So we complex three picks them up from inside the membrane from QH2 gives them the cytochrome C, which is on the outside, floating around in the, the solvent there. Right? And then complex four picks up the electrons from cytochrome C on the cytoplasmic side, because that's where it is. And it doesn't list it here, but we know it gives them to O2, which turns it into water, which is neither on any side. It's just water, right? It doesn't matter where it is when we're done. We turned O2 into water. There's water on both sides. Okay, so I want you to know what this chart is saying. Where, where they get them from, the electrons, and to whom do they give the electrons, and what side of the membrane or interior of the membrane is it. Right. So let's go through each of those four complexes one at a time and just talk about where things are going. So we just said for complex one that it grabs the electrons from NADH from the inside. So in this diagram, the bottom of the membrane is the matrix, or the bottom side of the membrane faces the matrix, and the top side of the figure faces the inner membrane space, which is continuous with the cytoplasm. So what happens here is the thing in yellow is the complex one, right? It spans the whole membrane. It picks up the electrons from NADH, turning NADH into NAD+. It's now been oxidized, right? And then I hand them to a bunch of carriers. Remember those iron sulfur clusters we talked about? There's some other ones in here too, like FMN, but you don't need to know all the names but I'm handing it to a bunch of carriers inside. The electron's kind of moving around within the complex. And eventually we will give it to a Q that is bound, right? Hopefully we give it the second one as well. It doesn't make the radical, uh, the radical ion. And then we have a QH2. It got the protons from the solvent, as you see, they're just along for the ride, mainly the electrons are what are interested in. And the QH2 can then leave and stay in the membrane. It doesn't leave the membrane. All that moving of electrons around, you can think of it simplistic way, as if you move electrons around, you create a circuit, right? And a circuit, very, very tiny circuit here, could power a motor, right? And that's what this thing is. 
It's a proton pump motor. So if you move the electrons around like this, for every pair of electrons that goes through here, we pump four protons from inside to outside. That's what this is showing with the four protons on the arrow. So two electrons move from NADH to Q, right, forming QH2, and it pumps four protons across the membrane. And that's all we're doing in this complex. It's, it's complex, but it's a simple idea. We're moving electrons from one carrier to the next through this complex, and we pump some protons. Okay. At this point, we can take a little detour and talk about complex two, which is much simpler. If you remember from the citric acid cycle, complex two is the same thing as the succinate dehydrogenase complex. Now, all this thing did was remove some electrons from succinate to make the double bond and fumarate. Right, so this was an oxidoreductase, of course. It used FAD as its cofactor. The FAD doesn't leave. I know it might look like it does, but it doesn't really leave the complex. It just holds on to those two electrons temporarily. Right, so we take two electrons from succinate. Right, two protons leave with it. We make the double bond and fumarate. We've already talked about all that. But we didn't tell you what happens to the electrons at that point. Now we will. So the two electrons that are on FAD, and now we have FADH2, are then given to Q, just like we did before. And Q becomes QH2. So the FAD really isn't a, a, a carrier as much as just a, a middleman. It's a transient molecule. Right? It's bound to complex two almost permanently. It doesn't really leave. Right? So the succinate donates the electrons to FAD it, it, temporarily, becoming FADH2. The FADH2 then donates those two electrons to Q, going back to FAD, and we have Q becoming QH2. So just like with complex one, we've transferred some electrons from one molecule to Q. In this case, for complex two, there is no pumping of protons across the membrane. It does not do that, right? Complex two does not pump protons. It already had a day job. Okay, so at this point, all of our electrons are located in QH2. So we move on to complex three. They're being delivered by QH2. It dumps them off at complex three. And then from complex three, those electrons are handed to cytochrome C, which is our water soluble carrier. But the problem here is cytochrome C can only carry one electron at a time. It can't carry two. And that's dangerous. If you only carry one, you keep your electrons paired as much as possible because paired electrons are rather safe unpaired electrons become radicals. So we don't like that. Right? So we, if we have a metal around, we can kind of mitigate that damage, but we don't like unpaired electrons. So let's try not to keep them around. So we have to have, have a way of managing two electrons showing up with a QH2 and one leaving with cytochrome C. The cytochrome C will go dump it off at complex four, come back and get the other one. It could only carry one at a time. Think of it as just a little small basket. It's not as big as the, the Q. I can't carry both. So it needs to deliver one, come back, get the second one, and deliver the second one. Meanwhile, complex three is hold, left holding a single electron, a radical, which is not safe. The normal figure to teach that is at the bottom there, and I really don't like it because it's hard to explain it to you. So I made my own figure. All right, so let's look at the one at the top of the slide here. So this is where the, the solubility issues come into play. So this is complex three. It looks like the number three, which is easy to remember, right? Think of it as a, a, a wharf or a pier, right? Where delivery trucks are showing up with electrons. The delivery trucks are gonna be our queues. And when they have electrons in their cargo, they're called QH2s. And then when they don't have electrons, they're just called queues again. Cytochrome C being water soluble, it shows up to the dock in a canoe. Why wouldn't you use a, a normal size boat I don't know, because you can only carry one electron at a time, so we're going to use a canoe. So he can only carry one electron at a time. However, there are people working on this dock, right? Remember, there's iron sulfur clusters, and there's actually heme groups, and there's coppers, and everything else along the way. They can hold some electrons for you, so I'm representing that by the red circle in the three, or on the, on the pier. So in the first panel, we just have complex three sitting there. There's no electrons around. Everybody's just waiting. And then a QH2 shows up in the second panel. Right? The QH2 has clearly got a, a full truckload of electrons, two of them, that's all that fit. 
and so it shows up and those electrons are transferred. One of them is given to the people on the, the pier, the little red circle there, and eventually hands that one electron to the guy in the canoe. Right? If you look at complex three, that's where we are. One of the electrons has been transferred from the truck to the pier to the canoe. And the canoe is leaving, so a little red arrow represents. Well, when that person in the canoe leaves with the one electron, I have one left over in the truck, and that's an unpaired electron. I'm at that QH dot stage again, which is dangerous because if it deprotonates, I'm going to have a radical ion. So instead of holding on to this dangerous single electron, they keep passing it around like a hot potato. Right? So you can put it on one truck or you can give it to the person on the dock. They can put it on the other truck that's sitting there. And the more places I can store it, the less likely it is to explode or give up its proton. And that's true for most molecules. The more ways you can represent it or more ways you can store something, the safer it is. You don't want to leave it on one truck by itself. So it can be moving around between those three locations, either on the complex, on the original truck, or on the other empty truck. So it can be on any one of those, making it a little safer while the guy's traveling in his canoe. The guy in the canoe, cytochrome C, brings the electron over to complex four, which we'll talk about in a second. And in the next panel, he shows up again, empty, can pick up the other remaining electron, right? And leave with it, All right? So he can leave with that other electron. When he leaves with the other one, we both have, both trucks are now empty. Either one, I showed the top one leaving, but either one could leave at this point. In fact, both could leave. And then we start over. A brand new, fully loaded truck, QH2, shows up and we repeat the cycle. So the idea behind this is two trucks can dock at once and they can serve as another place to store the unpaired electron while the canoe is off delivering the first one. Okay. So I apologize in the last figure, the cytochrome C guy in the canoe should also have an electron leaving. I have to fix that in the figure. Okay, so our cytochrome C delivering one electron at a time from complex three is going to paddle over. Remember, he's in the soluble part. He's water soluble. He's going to paddle over to another part of the, the dock, another part of the membrane, and arrive at complex four. Right? Complex four is waiting to accept them one at a time from the canoe. And when we finally collect four there, right? so I'm accepting one at a time, we're going to put them on lots of different places in this complex. When I finally get four accumulated, we're going to use all four to turn one O2 into two water molecules. Right? And of course, the protons are along for the ride. Right? So the whole goal here was to move the electrons down. And at the same time, I didn't show it in my little figure here, but it's on the previous one. As we're moving those electrons from the truck to the dock to the canoe, we also pump some protons. So complex three pumps protons. Complex two did not. Complex one pumped protons. And now complex four is also going to pump protons. So one, three, and four pumps and protons across the membrane as we move the electrons through. Two does not. All right, so the, the figure at the bottom here, which I, I modified because it had some misleading drawings in it. So at the bottom here, I kind of summarize those together. If you look at the bottom where the blue circle is, that's our citric acid cycle, we generated some NADHs and an FADH2. The NADHs deliver their electrons to complex one, which we've said before. Then that is delivered directly to Q. It doesn't go to complex two. It goes directly to Q. And as we do that, we pump four protons across the membrane at complex one. FADH2 got its electrons from succinate, gives them to Q as well, doesn't go to complex one, and two does not pump protons. I may have said that a few times. Complex two gives the electrons to Q, just like one did. Q ultimately delivers them to complex three. That's our little drawing we just did with the, the, the boats showing up and taking them one at a way at a time. So cytochrome C, which I added to the figure here, is on the inner membrane side, right? The outside, water soluble up there, and carries them over to complex four, one at a time. As we went through complex three there, we pump a couple protons. And as we get to complex four, we make another gradient of four protons at complex four and ultimately turn O2 into two water molecules. That should say two water molecules, but we're not gonna get into stoichiometry for this one. But the idea here is that when you have an NADH, you pump protons at complexes one, three, and four, whereas if you show up with an FADH2, you only pump at three and four, because it doesn't use complex one. 
So that's wonderful. We turned O2 into a bunch of water, but what was the point? Right? The point here was to pump a lot of protons across the membrane. So if you look at the figure at the top again, it's the same one from earlier. The, all this complex we talked about is represented by that yellow cylinder. We pump some protons across the membrane. And now they're outside. They'd like to come back into the matrix because we have a, a gradient. So we let them come back in. That's the little pink or purple thing on the right. We're going to let them come back through, and that's ATP synthase. And we'll talk about how it works. Okay, so here's complex 5, we call it. It's a, probably not a great idea to call it complex 5 because it isn't continued from the other complexes. It doesn't transport electrons at all. So we're just going to call it ATP synthase because that's what it does. So don't think of it as continuing the chain because the chain is ended. When you gave the electrons to O2 and made water, there's no more relay. The electron transfer is done. We are going to take advantage of that proton gradient, however. So we're going to let the protons come back across, and it's going to turn the structure. So briefly look at the structure on the right. It's, it's the ATP synthase and all its parts labeled by their, their designations and letters and Greek letters. So I want to label a few parts and explain what they do. So if you look at the top, there's a purple piece called A. There's an A subunit. It kind of looks like a little half moon cylinder. Right? Not quite a full cylinder. With a, it's a cylinder with a, a, a groove carved out of it. Right? If you look in there, there's also the C molecules. It's called the C ring. They're in blue. Right? And there's, let's, let's make it math easier on ourselves. Let's say there's nine of them. It's not always nine, but let's, let's imagine there are nine of them making this easy for you to, to learn. So the blue cylinders inside are in a ring, and then there's this purple half moon carved out cylinder that's kind of on the outside. And you can think of the blue ones as rotating within the purple cylinder, right? The part, they fill part of the cylinder of purple as they go through, and they just rotate. The blue molecules, they're just two alpha helices, as you see in the drawing at the top, the two alpha helices there all form into this nice ring structure and they rotate around. They're connected to the, I guess that's a purplish gamma subunit right underneath them, right? So they're connected directly to that and it turns with them. So the gamma subunit directly below, and the epsilon of course, the green one, but the important one's the gamma one, it turns with the blue cylinders. As they rotate, the gamma subunit turns with them. Now, if you could imagine the other purple B2, if it was not there, everything below would also turn with it. They're all connected, right? The alphas, the beta, the delta, all those would turn with the gamma subunit as the C ring turns. However, we have B2 there. And if you've, if you've learned anything about engineering terms, B2 is called a stator arm, right? It prevents something from turning it. It fixes its position with respect to something else. So because B2 and delta are there, think of delta as a piece of glue, Right? The alpha and beta subunits in yellow and orange down there will not turn with respect to A. Right? So A, B2, delta, alpha, and beta, none of those move. So when the C ring turns and the gamma subunit turns with it, you can think of the gamma as rubbing on the inside of the alpha and beta subunits. It turns against them. It pushes on them. Okay? Now I want you to imagine take, changing your point of view for a second. So pretend you're at, at the very bottom of this figure, at the bottom of the page, and looking up at the structure, right? Like the membrane would be in front of you. You're at the very bottom, and you're looking up at the structure. There's three alphas in orange there, and three betas in yellow. And you'd see them as, an, as a hexagon around you, right, in front of you. So you'd see a hexagon, three alphas and three betas alternating in like a hexagon structure. And at the very center of your view, you see the very tail of the gamma subunit sticking through in the center. Okay, so take your eye and put it from below and look up. And you'll see those six alphas and betas sitting there, three alphas, three betas, and the gamma in the center. And that's what the picture is on the next slide. So if you're looking up from below, you see there's three alphas and three betas. They're labeled with various colors or white here, blue, green, yellow, and white. And you see that gamma subunit in the center again. So... From this point of view, the gamma subunit doesn't really have a shape. You can't see what it looks like buried in the center of those subunits. But the gamma subunit is essentially like a camshaft in a car. Now, if you don't know what a camshaft is, Google a picture and it'll make sense when you're done looking at it. It's just a metal cylinder. 
and it's got lobes on it. So the lobes are, are areas where the, the cylinder is not so round, it's kind of an oblong shape. It's got a bulge on it. Okay? So that's what's happening down here at the bottom. If you look at this as a cylinder end on, you see the gamma subunit has a lobe and an indentation. Right? One part's kind of flat, one part has a, a protrusion sticking out, and one part has a little cavity or indentation. Remember, the outside subunits aren't turning. They, they're static. They don't move. But as we allow the protons to come back across the membrane through those C rings, and it makes it turn, we're going to turn that gamma subunit. And as the gamma subunit turns, the part that's a protrusion will point to different subunits of the alpha and beta ring. And when it points towards it, it compresses that protein, pushes on it. So if you push on a protein, things have to move. And when it moves, it actually takes the ADP and the phosphate and slams them together. It's just enough energy to put those two together to make an ATP. So we've turned a, a chemical gradient of protons into mechanical energy to turn this thing. And we retrieve that mechanical energy by putting a phosphate on ADP. So now we have it in the form of a potential energy in the bond. Right? So we turned chemical energy into mechanical energy and then mechanical energy back into stored energy in the phosphate and the bond between ADP and phosphate. Okay? And this thing turns around and around and around. Every time it turns one-third of the way around, or 120 degrees, one-third of 360, we make an ATP. So if this thing were to turn all the way around, we'd make three ATP. Okay, so going back to the other picture for one second, I told you we're going to imagine there's nine blue C cylinders, right? The C component, we're going to imagine there's nine of them. And you see they run through that little A half moon carved out piece, okay? and they rotate through there. It's hard to see in this figure, but there's two kind of caves or openings. They're very, very tiny. They're just enough for a proton to get through, so there's really not much space at all. But you see one of them's open to the outside. There's a little cavity that's open to the outside. And there's another cavity that's open to the inside, but the two don't connect. If they did, the protons would rush right through. So we don't let them connect. How the protons get through is they come down the top cavity, right, the opening to the outside. They come down the top cavity. They hop on one of the blue C rings, and they have to go all the way around the ring before they can reach the other side and get out. Right, so this forces the ring to turn. Right? So I have a picture of that here, so a bigger version of that picture. So it's like a little turnstile. If you come in from the top, right, the cytosolic half channel is open to the cytoplasm or inner membrane space. The proton comes in. It can only go so far. It can only get halfway through this thing, through that channel. So it comes in here at the top, right, flows down this channel, but cannot get across. It must hop on one of these blue C components, travel all the way around that ring, and when it comes around the ring, it has access to the matrix half channel, and then can flow out. So it's like the little metal turnstile picture I have, except the way you go through this turnstile is you come in from the top, you have to go around it, and then you can go out the bottom. So I couldn't find a great picture of that, but in your mind, you can imagine it. If I had a, a turnstile like this, but it was a spiral staircase, and you're coming from above, you'd have to go around as you push the bars, Right? and then you go out the bottom. But you must go around to get through. You can't just fall through. I couldn't find a great picture of something like that. It's in your imagination at the moment. But uh, imagine a spiral staircase where you'd have to turn those bars to go down. Right? Wouldn't be very comfortable or fun to do. But that's how you get through this thing. Right? You have to take a ride around this blue ring in order to get it across. And what happens is because there's more protons on the outside than the inside, there's always a, a potential or an impetus for this thing to turn and let them across because they want to restore the gradient. Or re not restore, but deplete the gradient. So this thing turns and makes ATP. Why did I say there were nine blue cylinders? So what really happens is as this thing's turning, we let one proton go across, we let a second proton go across, and then we let a third proton go across. Three of the blue cylinders shift through this half channel here, right? What's really happening is we're putting a lot of stress on the connection between the blue cylinders and that gamma subunit, right? So we're kind of twisting one and the other is not wanting to turn below. But as the third proton goes through, the bottom snaps one third of the way around. So it builds up a lot of stress 
and then it snaps 120 degrees quickly, which is the force needed to make the ATP. Three more protons go through, we build up another stress in the twist, and it snaps another 120 degrees. And of course we do it again a third time, we've gone all the way around, nine protons have gone across, and we've made our third ATP. So the question is, how many protons does it take going across to make one ATP? We're imagining there's nine blue cylinders. So we're letting the proton come down. It hops on the blue ring, rides around. Right? As we ride around, another one escapes. And it takes three of those protons coming across to turn it one-third of the way around, because there's nine of them. And so when it turns one-third of the way around, we make an ATP. So it takes three protons to go across to make one ATP. If nine protons go across, we make three ATP. If 30 protons go across. We've made 10 ATP. It's 3 to 1 ratio. Okay. And here's a little figure that shows that in action. On the, the bottom left, you see that the proton comes in from the top. And as the blue cylinders rotate through the pink one, the pink one, or purple one, sorry, doesn't move, the protons move around. And as they get to the other side, they can then escape into the matrix. And as long as there's a gradient, more protons outside than there are inside, this thing keeps turning. Right? It can't go in the other direction. If it tries to rotate the other way, then it's going to try to put protons into a, from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. And there's no incentive to do that. There's no motivation. They'd rather deplete the gradient, right? restore equilibrium. So the protons come in, it rotates only clockwise, and it comes out the bottom. And of course, we're not showing it in this figure, but this blue ring of C blue proteins is attached to that gamma subunit, and as it turns, it's making the ATP. Now you probably can Google that and find a couple movies of that. I used to have links in here, but I don't think my links work anymore. You've got the new version of it. So here's a summary on the top right of everything we just did today. Uh, this figure is a little confusing at first because of the way they drew it, but let me walk you through it. The smaller piece shows the mitochondria. Right? The, the grayish membrane is the outer membrane, and then the yellow membrane is the inner membrane. Unfortunately, when they show the inset, they now show the membrane as gray. It should be yellow again, but I see why they did it, but it, that can be confusing. Also, the very center of the mitochondria, the matrix, which is this area inside, right? is actually represented by the little square as outside here, labeled matrix up there, just because of the way they pulled the, the little inset out. So the inner membrane space between the gray and yellow membranes is actually represented right here by the middle of this little inset. Right, so it's a weird way to draw it, and it can be confusing, but I want you to remember that we're taking electrons from NAD or FAD or NADH and FADH2 and giving them to these complexes, one or two, they're passed down all the way to four to turn O2 into water. Along the way, we're pumping protons across the membrane, not at complex two, but at complexes one, three, and four. And they end up outside the mitochondria in this little drawing that's the center of the drawing, but it's pumped out. We then have excess protons outside compared to inside the matrix. They come back across through ATP synthase. We just talked about how that turns. And for every three that come across, we make one ATP as it turns one third of the way around. Okay? And this can keep going indefinitely as long as I keep supplying it with materials. As long as I keep supplying it with new O2 as a sink for the electrons, I'm going to need some new NADHs and FADH2, so I'm going to continue doing my glycolysis and citric acid cycle. And I also need to continue supplying it with ADP to make ATP. But I have a problem. If I keep turning all the ADP into ATP, I need to transport the ATP outside so I can use it in the cytoplasm. And if I transport it all outside, I'll have no more ADP to make new ones. 
So I have a, a way to fix that. And that's this ADP ATP transport, right? It's a transload case and all it does is take an ATP from inside to outside and at the same time, an ADP from outside to inside. So how do I do this exchange? ATP and ADP are highly charged, large molecules. There's no way they're gonna go across the membrane. So I need a, a carrier or a, a machine that, that transports ferries one to the other, right? It's a very small machine, easy the way it works, but it's very abundant in the membrane. It accounts for 14% of the protein in the membrane. So we clearly find it important to transport this ATP out. But does it cost anything? Let's talk about it. What is the charge on ATP? Well, it's an adenine attached to ribose. And then there's three phosphates. The first phosphate has a charge of minus one. Second phosphate has a charge of minus one. The last phosphate, since it's not attached to anything else, has a minus two charge. So ATP has an overall minus four charge. ADP only has two phosphates on it. So the first one has a minus one charge and the second one has a minus two charge because it isn't attached to anything else. So ADP has a minus three charge. Now I want you to imagine a membrane and I take an ATP from the inside of it and send it outside. So I've effectively moved a minus four charge from inside to outside. Keep that in mind. I've also taken an ADP and moved it from outside to inside. So I moved a minus three charge from outside to inside. Taken together, I've effectively moved a minus one charge out. Because I put a minus four out and a minus three in, that's just like moving a minus one out. Is that a favorable thing to do? Well, if you think about it, yes because we have a lot more protons outside than inside. There's more positive charges outside. So to move a minus one out there with them is a favorable thing to do. It's the same thing as moving a plus one in. So it's almost free to move our ATP out if you let an ADP go in, but I do consume one proton of my gradient. That proton can't be used to make more ATP because I consumed it with this charge difference. So effectively it takes three protons going across the membrane to make the ATP, but then I gotta spend one, I gotta pay a shipping and handling charge, and right? I gotta pay one more proton of my gradient to export it. So this mitochondria doesn't subscribe to Amazon Prime. Well, if we were covering photosynthesis, you'll see that chloroplasts do, they get free shipping. But this isn't free shipping. I gotta pay one proton to get that ATP out. Okay? So if I keep doing that, I can keep making ATP, I don't have a problem. Until I look closer, if I put an ATP out and an ADP in, as in this figure here, I'm eventually going to run out of phosphates. So looking at this picture here, let's follow what's going on. This little blue thing is my transporter, right? So we'll start at step one. An ADP from the cytoplasmic side or the inner membrane side binds. The whole thing flips over and it lets an ADP into the matrix, the bottom side. Then an ATP from the matrix binds, it flips over again and lets the ATP out into the cytoplasm. Well, yes, that cost me one of my gradient, right? Because I lost a negative charge from the interior. It's the same as moving a positive charge in. But if I keep doing this over and over, yes, I do resupply the inside with ADP, but there's no phosphates for it. I need to get another raw phosphate to keep going. So we'll use this Rude Goldberg machine to get phosphates in. It's gonna seem crazy at first, but there's a rationale behind it. So I want you to think of these little transporters in the membrane, same membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, as really specialized toll booths, right? So I was told I need a, an ATP out if you give me an ADP in. That's the first one in red there. That's the one we just talked about, how it flips over. But to continue, I also need to get phosphates put inside. So there's a green toll booth that says, I'll give you a phosphate if you give me a malate. So I'll get a phosphate in if I send a malate out. Remember, malate was part of our citric acid cycle. Well, now I have a problem about a malate. So I have another yellow toll booth that says, I'll give you a malate if you give me a citrate. Well, now I still have a problem. I'm going to run out of citrate. So I could make more citrate if I were to get some pyruvate in because from pyruvate, I could make citrate. So 
I need a pyruvate. So they'll give me a pyruvate in the blue toll booth if I give you a hydroxide. And now I'm finished with the, the Rube Goldberg machine because all I really need to do is send out a phosphate or send out a, a hydroxide, sorry. If I send out a hydroxide, that's a favorable thing. Again, it consumes my gradient, right? We could eliminate all the middlemen and all that you know, questing of exchanging of malate and citrate and pyruvate and so forth and just use the toll booth on the far right. You give me a phosphate if I give you a hydroxide. And that also exists. So why bother with the other four colored toll booths? Just use the one on the right. Because sometimes I want to move a malate out. and Sometimes I want to move a pyruvate in. I want to move a citrate around. So those things are useful for other processes in the cell, like nu nucleogenesis of new glucose, gluconeogenesis. We didn't cover that one. Or we move it around to make other things. But effectively, we just need to get more phosphate in. And I'm doing that by sending a hydroxide out, whether you use the complicated system of multiple toe booths or just the one on the right. So that picture at the bottom shows all those things put together. Again, this is that weird inverted look where the matrix is on the top and the intermembrane space is on the outside. But if you follow along again, we have our citric acid cycle down there in blue that's generating a lot of NADHs and FADH2, all those electrons. We send them down the electron transport chain indicated by the, the arrow going to the right in pink. And of course, as we hand them off to those electron carriers, they're oxidized back to NAD+. And for some reason, they drew FAD+. We can argue with these figures all day and find mistakes. There's no plus on FAD. But we can regenerate those and we can keep con continuing the citric acid cycle at that point. We eventually give those electrons to O2 to make water. All along the way, we've been pumping protons out from the matrix to the intermembrane space. ATP synthase, that pink blob on the right, lets them back in, right? But then I need to get the ATP out. So I do my exchange that's shown at the top. I let an ATP out if I let an ADP in. But of course, I'm gonna need a phosphate to continue. So using that last toll booth, I can let a phosphate in if I let a hydroxide out. And all this can continue as long as I keep supplying it with fuel, acetyl-CoA and oxygen. And lastly, I want to talk about what could go wrong with this process. We already mentioned one thing. If our coenzyme Q, or ubiquinone, only gets one electron instead of two, it can form this radical, which is dangerous. So we need some antioxidants like vitamin E to take care of that. But we also have other problems. What if you take this drug called 2,4-dinitrophenol? It was marketed as a weight loss drug back in the, I think it was the early 90s, right? And a lot of bodybuilders take this 2,4-dinitrophenol and it helps them to stay in shape, lose weight and so forth. But it can be very dangerous. Right? What this molecule does is it transports protons across membranes for free, right? So it's it's just a molecule that can gain a proton. It's lipid soluble, it stays in the membrane, and it just drifts from one side to the other, right? No particular direction. But if there's more protons on one side than the other, it will tend to move them across downhill. So if you take a lot of this 2,4-dinitrophenol, this drug, you're gonna uncouple your gradient from ATP synthesis. So in other words, your electron transport chain will keep pumping protons, making this gradient, but you're gonna keep diffusing it. So you won't make a lot of ATP. You'll consume a lot of oxygen, you'll consume your fuels, your sugars, your acetyl-CoA's, but you won't make a lot of ATP. So that's a great way to burn fats and burn calories without making a lot of energy so your body gets very lean. The problem is, if you let the protons across for free, that energy goes somewhere, right? It's never just destroyed. So the energy is released as heat, right? It heats up the membrane. Right, so it's like an electrical wire. If you just let current flow through a wire, it eventually will heat up the wire. The more resistance the wire has, the faster it heats up. That's how the how electricity works. So we're moving protons across the membrane. Same thing, it's gonna heat up the membrane if we don't do something with the energy. We're not turning up a machine to make ATP, so the energy's not going into that. It's just gonna be released as heat. If you take enough of this 2,4-dinitrophenol, there's been people who have, have died of taking this with brain temperatures of 109 degrees Fahrenheit. 
you could take the patient, dump them in buckets of ice, and it won't cool them off because the heat's being generated from within. All their mitochondria are little batteries that are generating heat and are not making any ATP. So this is deadly if you take too much of this. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's not something you can flush out. It's in the membranes of your mitochondria. So there's been bodybuilders who take ODs of this and they end up dying from brain temperatures of 109, 107 degrees Fahrenheit. It's deadly. Okay. But the body also has a, a similar system to this. It's not so uncontrolled. We let protons back across all the time for free. We don't make ATP out of it. It's called the uncoupling protein one, right? We have multiple ones, but we'll talk about number one. And it's basically just a little channel there shown in green that just says protons, you want to go back across? Here, here's a free channel, go across. And just like the 2,4-dinitrophenol, it generates heat, but we can close this channel, right? It's controlled. It's not something just lets them cross all the time, like the molecule. 2,4 DMP does. So this uncoupling protein one is a protein that we can control, open and close. We have, we have a mechanism for taking it out of the membrane as well. So newborn animals, including humans, right? Um, hibernating animals, especially animals that are like new, just born. If, if you're brand new, you just came out of a 37 degree oven and you're at room temperature effectively, right? So we put babies in incubators as humans, but when most mammals are born, they're born at whatever the internal body temperature of the mother is, and suddenly they're at room temperature. Whether that's in a cold or warm environment, it's generally colder than 37 degrees. So suddenly their body is cooling off rapidly. They need to warm themselves. And if you've ever seen newborns, the muscles don't work, right? The brain hasn't made the connections yet for most of their muscles. Now, for some animals, yes, like gazelles, they get up and run. But for many animals, their newborns are helpless. So how do they stay warm? Well, mom could wrap them up in their own fur, but they need a way of, of keeping themselves warm on their own as well. So they use this uncoupling mechanism. If you were to get cold as an adult, or even as a child, as human, you, can, you have control of your muscles at this point. You can shiver, right? You can purposely contract your muscles and generate heat because the muscle's doing work, but it's not really moving anything but the bones themselves. So you're just generating heat by the contractions. Newborns can't do this. They have no control over their muscles. So the connections haven't been made yet to the neurons. They're still developing. So they use this uncoupling protein to purposely just let protons go back across. They don't need a lot of ATP, not as much as we do from running around with our muscles and such. So they just do that to stay warm. Hibernating animals do the same thing. They make a lot of this uncoupling protein, let it decouple their membranes to keep their cells warm. It doesn't make a lot of ATP, Right? because they don't need it at the time. They just need to stay warm. Right? We do not make ATP by doing this, so our yield of ATP goes drastically down. We still consume O2, we're still using our fuels, but where energy is going to stay warm, we're generating heat, not making ATP. The problem with that 2,4-dinitrophenol is we do this in an uncontrolled manner if you take too much of it. Right? So the substance is banned, of course. But if you take too much of it, you could cause this uncoupling to happen in an uncontrolled manner and the cells just continually heat up. You can't stop the reaction. 